So we've been in 1 Corinthians, and now we're on a chapter 4. We're going to do chapter 4 and chapter 5 today. So if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. While y'all are turning, I'll tell you, I saw this uh, old beat-up station wagon. They had a bumper sticker on it. That bumper sticker said, don't be fooled, my treasure is up in heaven. Amen. start just let me uh let's pray real fast father just thank you for the freedom to gather here this morning in your name lord i just pray that you help me get through this class and uh, i pray it's a blessing to people lord please don't let me say anything that's not so lord be be with our teachers next door as they teach our children yes. and lord be with our pastor today Amen. as he shares your message lord and uh Lord, we love you and we honor you in all, all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Verse 1, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So up to this point in the letter, uh, Paul, he's been addressing the divisions in the church as well as the foolish, puffed-up wisdom of men. Here he continues to deal with the problem of factions in the church, and he urges them to account or to think of them as ministers of Christ. So that rather than to think of Paul and Apollos and Peter's as Peter as competing leaders, uh, they should think of them as ministers of equal rank. Amen. And note that the word translated here as ministers is huperetes. It's different than the word translated as ministers in the last chapter, chapter 3, verse 5. Uh, Huperatus, it means an under rower, a, subord a subordinate rower, or an under oarsman, and it, it stresses subordination. If you can imagine uh, back in them days, boats were usually, they were powered by the oar, and a lot of times they used slaves to propel a ship across water. If you can imagine a man standing in the bow of a boat saying, row, 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 and these slaves or, or under uh, rowers just subordinately rowing every time. But uh, the word, the, the word in uh, chapter 3, verse 5, that's translated as ministers is diakonos, and diakonos, it has the idea of an attendant or a helper that assists a master. Uh, the word translated as stewards, which is oikonomos, I ain't trying to get fancy with Greek all, but it, it has a point. <laughs> the word translated as steward, it means a uh, slave in the master's household that's usually entrusted with property. So uh, the, the point I'm getting at is that uh, uh, th both these words, ministers and stewards, they emphasize subordination to the master. I went like a long route to make that point, but that's the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> I ain't trying to lose nobody right off the bat. <laughs> but uh, so the point that Paul is driving at is that Apollos, uh, Peter, and, and himself, they were, they were subordinates under the leadership of Christ. Amen. And uh, they were entrusted with the mysteries of God, which is the message of the cross revealed in these New Testament times, only known by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Verse 2, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So Paul, he's stressing accountability here because, I mean, we're stewards of the message of the cross, man. That's a big deal, and we need to be faithful and, and handle that precious, that precious message very carefully. Amen. It's only the most important revelation that God's ever given mankind. Amen. And we'll take that message to all ends of the earth. Verses 3 through 4. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of a man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self, 
For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Amen. So Paul, he's talking to his critics in the Corinthian church. Uh, he points out that it's a very small matter whether they criticize him or not. He wasn't going to be deflected from his ministry because the, the worldly wise people rejected him or criticized him. And you know, he didn't answer to them, nor any man. He didn't even answer to himself. Paul says, he that judges me is the Lord. So his point here is simple. He's only going to give account of his ministry to the Lord and the Lord only and not to any man. Verse 5. Therefore it's judged nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsel of the hearts, and shall every man have praise of God. Here Paul warns them to stop criticizing him prematurely before the time. When the Lord returns, he'll, he'll bring to light the hidden things of darkness, such as sin. And the Lord, who knows, uh, or, and he'll also make evident the motives of the heart, whether that heart is true or not. The Lord, who, who knows our hearts and mind, he's going to give each of us our due praise Amen. one day. And because that praise comes from him and not man, we better make sure that our service is, is truly for him and not for our own self-glory. Verse 6, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. So Paul, he uses himself and the other apostles as examples of faithfulness that did not go beyond that which was written. They obeyed the word of God and, and not their own inclinations or worldly opinions. Uh, from the example of their lives, Paul hoped the Corinthians would, would learn the lesson of humility. Now keep in mind that Paul, he's dealing with Greeks here, and uh, this is kind of a difficult lesson for him because they believed humility was a despicable trait of a slave and a sign of weakness and, and not a characteristic of great men. Uh, verse 7. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? So Paul's telling them, and the same is true for us, that, that whatever spiritual gifts and talents that they have is given, them to, given to them by God and, and God alone. There's no room for pride and self-conceit when all this di distinction being made among them about who's the most gifted or the most talented it is, it's all owing to God anyways. Amen. You know, our gifts and talents, they certainly ain't a product of our own cleverness. That's right. uh, yesterday when we was passing that Christmas play, I was sitting there watching Bethany play piano. She, may, she plays a mean piano. She's, them fingers just flowing all over those fingers. Uh, keys, whatever you call them, and uh, she wasn't even looking at them. And I told her afterwards, yeah, you got a God-given talent, you know. And Bethany, she ain't no honky-tonk on a Friday night playing boogie-woogie music. She's Amen. here at church giving, giving her gift uh, back to the Lord, and she's Amen. really humble about it. So. <laughs> Not trying to pick on you, but just, I think we should be that way with our gifts. Amen. But, uh, Anyhow, uh, the, the Corinthians and us too are merely the recipients of these gifts and, and not the creator, so there's just no room to self-glory. Verse 8, now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings without us, and I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. Uh, Paul, he seems to be a little sarcastic right here. You know, one day we will be full and and we will be rich, and, and we will be reigning as kings. Christians will reign with the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back and sets up his kingdom on earth. But that time ain't yet, though. Uh, the Corinthians, they seem to have it backwards, and they're living as if they have all these things already. And, and Paul, he sarcastically tells them that he wishes that he and the apostles could reign with them, too. Um, I've read somewhere that, that lifetime is training time, for reigning time. There's a lot of, a lot of truth in that. Uh, but in the meantime, 
our privilege it is to share the reproach of the rejected Savior. Amen. Uh, verses 9 through 13. For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed, a, appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger, and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world, and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. So, do you all see the contrasting picture that, that Paul's painting between the apostles and the church at Corinth? Paul and the apostles, they're out there really suffering and, and, and enduring hardship for Jesus Christ. And uh, they're being treated as fools for his sake. While the Corinthians, they're living their best life now like, like they go to a, a prosperity gospel church. Uh, the apostles, they followed the path of Jesus Christ's humiliation. And uh, just as Jesus, he marched a a paraded route to his death well, so did the apostles uh, as Christ had suffered uh, deprivation and defamation so did his servants and uh, in his spirit they endured and they responded with grace it says they were persecuted and they suffered it the suffered means they, they allowed it uh, the, the apostles they really lived out the message of the cross and uh, they were made as the filth of the world and the scum of all things. And uh, I, I think this description of suffering for the sake of Christ should speak to all of our hearts. Uh, if the Apostle Paul, if he were living today, would he be able to say to us, uh, have you reigned as kings without us? Just something to think about. Well, Paul, he really, uh, all the apostles, they, they really took a beating for Christ. And they, that's how much they love the Lord. And just think about this world. Think about where it's heading right now. You can already see the persecution that's coming our way, especially with this homosexual agenda, this, this leftist progressive uh, mentality that's taken over this country, and it's getting more authoritarian by the minute. So you need to be ready to suffer for Jesus. Amen. Uh, All right, verses 14 through 16. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. So Paul's motive in presenting all of this was it wasn't to shame his carnal brethren, but rather to warn them using some uh, hyperbole, he, he basically says that though they have 10,000 instructors, they had only one father humanly, one spiritual father humanly, because it was Paul who led them to Christ. Uh, he was their spiritual father in the sense of having won them to Christ, Amen. and he urges them to follow him as their spiritual father. Yeah. Don't think that there's any pride here. Paul, he's already established early in his letter his humble heart as the one who led them to Christ and as the one who uh, prayed and wept over them. Verse 17, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So it's easy to tell by Paul's letters that he was real close with Timothy and he had much trust in him. Uh, and it's clear uh, in, in the other epistles that Timothy had remained loyal to Paul to the very end, and he never abandoned him when others did. Uh, if, if you've read his epistles to Timothy, especially uh, Second Timothy, where Paul, he's awaiting execution. He's in prison awaiting execution, and he's 
he's writing to Timothy, telling him how to carry on. You can see how much trust he had in Timothy. Uh, but anyhow, there's, there's no doubt that if the Corinthians had any questions on how to follow the apostle Paul, Timothy, he would be there to clarify any problems that they had. Verse 18 through 20. Now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in, pow- is not in word, but in power. So when, uh, when, when Paul was explaining that he was sending Timothy to him, I'm, I'm sure that some of the detractors there in the Corinthian church were probably suggesting that that Paul was too scared to come himself but Paul he makes sure that they know that he will come in the near future if the Lord wills and when he does he will expose the pride of, of those who talk so freely but they have no spiritual power but you know after all it's it it's power that counts because the kingdom of God it's not it, it ain't empty talk it's, it's power. It's, it's meaningful action. Amen. Verse 21. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? So Paul gives them an option on how they would like Paul, Paul to greet them. Should he come to them with a rod, which, which represents discipline and chastisement? Or should he come to them in love and in the spirit of meekness? It's, it's their choice. They can either be rebellious or they can be, they can be humble and submissive. But anyhow, Paul, he now leaves this particular problem and he moves on in, in the next chapter to another problem. And sadly, the Corinthian church had more than their share of problems. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. So apparently one, in the, one of the men in the fellowship there at Corinth had committed sexual immorality, and clearly it was a, a very extreme form of sin, one that was not even practiced among the ungodly Gentiles. Specifically, the sin was that the man had illicit intercourse with his father's wife. So his father's wife is obviously his stepmother. And uh, an incestuous affair with one's stepmother, it's prohibited in both the Old Testament and it's also prohibited in Roman law, too. And uh, this woman, she, she probably wasn't a Christian because nothing is said about disciplining her. Uh, verse 2, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So to make matters wor- worse, the, the church, they evidently was, they, they were aware of this sin and they did nothing about it. In this shameful situation, it didn't seem to face the Corinthians in the least. If anything, they remained uh, uh, arrogant and bloated in their spirits, but the godly response it would have been to to grieve for this brother and and uh, and execute discipline, which would exclude him from fellowship with the congregation until he came to a place of repentance. Verse three: For I verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. So Paul, therefore, he sent, he sent his judgment via long distance. Uh, although he was in Ephesus, he had already judged the matter as though he were present. Uh, he knew what needed to be done concerning this man. Verse 4 through 5, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So, 
here Paul he pictures the church being assembled together to take action against the offender here and although he's not present bodily he's there in spirit as they meet in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ you know Jesus he's given authority to the church and, and to the apostles to ex exercise discipline discipline concerning these matters um, so thus Paul says he would act with the power or authority of our Lord Jesus now although this man is to be delivered over to Satan excommunicated from the church uh, for the destruction of the flesh his soul can still be saved in the day of our Lord so whether destruction of the flesh means physical suffering or illness or disease that that God allows to, to break a man of simple lust and habits or, or whether it's a description of slow death which gives man a, a time to repent um, we should remember that discipline of believers it, it's always calculated in a way to to bring about restoration to fellowship with the Lord and the ultimate point is that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nowhere in this session, there's no thought being given of the man's eternal damnation. He's disciplined in this life because of the sin that he committed, but he's saved in the day of the Lord. And I, I think this verse, it, it lends strong support to the doctrine of eternal security that we teach from the Bible in this church. Uh, verse 6 through 7. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Paul, now he's reprimanding the Corinthians for their glorying and, and boasting. They should have known that a little leaven leaveneth the, lo the whole lump. A little leaven such as yeast or bacon powder it will affect the whole batch of dough and cause it to rise uh, leaven here is a picture of moral sin Paul's saying that if they tolerate a little bit of sin in the church it will soon grow and expand and until the whole church is seriously affected as a whole uh, righteous and godly discipline it, it's necessary in order to maintain the character of the church Paul, he don't tell them to, well, just try your best to do a little better. No, he commands them to purge out the old leaven. Yep. Purge it out. You know, they, they should take stern action uh, against evil so that they may be a new, pure lump. Then Paul, he adds, since you are truly unleavened, since they are in Christ, God sees them as holy and, and righteous and pure. So what Paul is saying is that their state should, should correspond to their standing. Right. You know, they're unleavened because they're in Christ. And they should also be unleavened in practice, right? Uh, Jesus Christ, who is, who is the sinless Passover lamb, who was sacrificed for us in the purity of his sinlessness, uh, it's flagrant sin it shouldn't be tolerated it, it shouldn't just be in the midst of the church being being tolerated because it, it's truly it's a violation of the pure character of Christ's body I hope I made sense right there uh, verse 8 therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So it's thought that Paul, he had wrote this epistle right before the Passover was about to take place, so it was very heavy on his mind. So he's telling them not to keep the upcoming feast with the unleaven of sin, nor keep it with the, I'm, I'm sorry, he's telling them not to keep the upcoming feast with the leaven of sin, I said unleaven. Don't keep it with the leaven of sin cause, right. because leaven is, is representative of sin. And uh, also not to keep it with the leaven of malice. 
which is probably a reference to the disunity and factions there in the church. And don't keep the, the feast with the leaven of wickedness, which is probably a reference to the man who just committed this sexual immorality. He tells them, keep the feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to accompany with fornicators. So it ev evidently Paul, he had written a letter to the Corinthians before, and he addressed how to deal with fornicators in that letter. But verse 10, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. So, of course, Paul is not telling not to have any association with vile and sinful men because in order to do that you just have to leave this world you'd have to go out of this world um, his point is that God's people ought not tolerate open flagrant sin in the church you know the world's bad enough as it is and we can't remove ourselves from it entirely but we can remove unrepentant sinners from the church verse 11 but now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reller, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one, no, not to eat. So the focus is remaining upon the church, and he names, he, he, he names six simple types right here. The first, fornication, which needs no explanation. The second, covetous. And that usually refers to one, somebody who seeks, uh, who loves and, and seeks for more money. It can also mean to be greedy or to want what others have. Uh, three, idolater, uh, which in, it most, in its most direct sense refers to worship of a false god. But it also refers to professing Christians at that time who were attending these pagan feasts and and eating uh, meat that was already been offered to idols. Uh, the fourth is reller, and reller refers to someone who has a mouth that causes mischief and, and passes gossip and, and sows discord. Uh, the fifth, a drunkard, that's obvious. And you know, I was talking to Courtney and Keegan last night about how I wasted 20 years of my life being a drunkard. And uh, there's nothing good about being a drunkard. No. I wish I had that 20 years back. Uh, the sixth, being extortioner, this usually refers to the robbing of another. Uh, in this context, though, it's, it's probably more uh, geared towards defrauding others. But anyhow, these were all potential situations Paul had warned about uh, in the, within the church. And his advice was simple. With such a one, don't eat with them. Don't, don't break bread with them. Don't eat with them. And the greater idea is just don't have fellowship with professing Christians who engage in such behavior. Uh, verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? And his point here is simple. Don't worry about passing judgment uh, on them outside of the church, those that are in the world, uh, but rather their concern should be to judge them that are within. Because verse 13 says, But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves that wicked person. And uh, I'll close right there on the apostle's words. And y'all's dismissed.